Last time on Hunter x Hunter, a lot of people fell to their deaths. But we're cheerful anyway. <laughs> the journey continues. Yes, the joy of cooking overshadows the brutality of their deaths. We are really <laughs> risking our lives. <laughs> Show it on X, on the X airship. Yes, airship episode, maybe. It's only phase three, man. It's been a journey so far. Why bother? They're all going to be dead soon anyway. Okay. <laughs> Silence is loud on beans. Thank you, Bean. It's a test. It's a test. Don't do anything. I have a lot of concerns about this thing. I mean, yeah. Like, I know he's just tricking them, because everyone in this exam are jerks. But <laughs> admittedly, there's like some validity to this threat, given the, the structure of this exam. The what a shock. Everything's a test, though. Sleeping shifts. I use her too. Yeah, dude has a bloodthirst. Are we sure we want him? What evils are we fighting? Oh, okay. Yeah. This building to something. Yeah, getting villain vibes for sure. What is it they say in the intro? The the word unknown has magic or has a special power. The hunter thing is, is that was really creepy. The hunter thing is much bigger than hunting. It's like light and dark. It's like the the secrets of the universe or life itself. I think that's partly the significance of Gon's near death experience about Hisoka the clown. I don't know exactly what it means, but I feel like that was a significant shot of him building up the cards only to knock them down. It's still vague, but there's something forming in this arc with the hunter exam and what it implies about hunters with Gon's near death experience with Hisoka and with the intro talking about the unknown having power. It's something about the truth of existence and therefore one's life with both the, the good and the bad, like getting the full truth value of the whole thing. This might be off, but like there might be something Kimbley-ish about Hisoka in the sense that they're observers wanting to see like the maximum possible experience or strength maybe, no matter what that means, kind of being along for the ride. I'm trying to figure out the card analogy, building things up and then knocking it down. I mean, maybe he wants to destroy things, but wants them to be at their optimal point because of the raw potential or experience or something like that, that that would bring, like getting the maximum satisfaction about beating the hardest challenge or destroying something beautiful. I and mean, watching it again, the, the Joker fell on the top of the pile and he's the Joker. Oh, this could be a sore spot. Very specific, thank you. Okay. I'm sure it was a very healthy upbringing with no, no damage or trauma whatsoever. That's relatable though. Can't do the same thing as both your parents. Whoa, that escalated. <laughs> ah, this is getting really disturbing. Wow, I can <laughs> partly see why he and Gon are bonding. The family baggage is real. Meanwhile, Gon is listening and all I can think is, wow, you have parents? Given the obvious influence between the two shows, is this foreshadowing for Anya stabbing Yor in the face? Honestly, I don't fully know what to make of this Kalua confession because on one reading of it, it's like a perfectly relatable family thing where, you know, parents have high expectations of you, want you to lead a certain life and how, like that might work for some people and it's great if it does, but I think a, a common reaction from kids is having a desire to distinguish yourself, find your own journey. Like for me, both my parents are musicians and that had a very strong impact on me in not wanting to be a musician. I just have a gut feeling that in order to healthily follow a family legacy or, or to pick something up that's been built for you, you need to find a way to make it your individual pursuit and endeavor as well. Like there has to be some kind of tie that's authentically chosen, not just inherited. 
and your default, which is certainly possible. But then on the other side of the story, his parents are assassins. So I don't know what to make of that fully in a fantasy setting. But wow, between the two of them, it's the blind leading the blind. Kalua's relationship with his family is almost certainly going to come up again. I know this guy's powerful. It was me. I like dashed over here for some reason. He's scoping them out. Clue's gonna say too easy. <laughs> this is too fun, yeah. Right. A lot of bravado. But I feel like he has a very soft, childlike core. It's all a little bit too much. Nothing to lose, right? Today's vocabulary is stabbing my mom in the face. Oh, speaking of spy family. Is it dodgeball? I think they should probably work at it together, but okay. Maybe that's the lesson here. Kalua's bravado, playing right to his pride. What? I didn't know he could do that. He's using quick attack. Or double team. You can't say he's gifted and bright. Wow, he's working so hard he even took his hands out of his pockets. Should work together. He's just gonna put his whole body on the line. He probably, on some level, is hoping that they'll they'll beat him. People with great ability typically like seeing great ability in others. And a good examiner wants the students to pass an exam. Oh yeah, Go Gon and Clue are, are also just not sleeping by choice. That's what I'm saying. Why did that not occur to them? Ooh, Clue has a big weakness. It's misdirect. <laughs> Damn, the other shoe! That's devious. A-level subterfuge right there. Well, they're definitely on his radar now, these two. Chip on your shoulder much? ゲーベ。俺の負け。うん。右手と左足ほとんど使ってないんだよ。え?それなのにこのアリ様だ。これじゃ1年中かけましたって。ボールなんか奪えない。I wonder if this will come in significant later. Clua seems more powerful than Gon, but he's got the classic trademarks of child prodigy, up to and including the the quitting when things are not going well for him. It's not the fact that he's wrong that I'm commenting on. He probably couldn't do it. I think it's more the emotion behind it, the getting frustrated by and taking personally the fact that it's out of his range. Whereas Gon's approach to this feels a little bit more free, less burdened by pride or other kinds of emotional baggage. The kid is just thrilled to be here. I don't know. For Kalua, there's something about being gifted, especially being told you're gifted, that lends itself very naturally to being a sore loser. I mean, just for anyone, if you identify success as like a core character trait, as opposed to like the underlying abilities, or skills, or habits that lead to success, difficulty or failure becomes something like a threat to your identity. I mean, that's a much more insidious problem than just the whole prodigy thing. Identifying anything that's not like actually habitually actionable as a core personality trait sets you up for some weirdness. And that's both positive and negative things. Like people who experience a failure, for example, and are very, very quick to conceptualize that as them being failures as some sort of intrinsic property. That's a recipe for disaster. And then likewise, as I mentioned, people who internalize outcome or expect outcome as a as a raw intrinsic personality trait have to avoid challenges because of the existential threat that that carries. Interesting to see if and how those two different philosophies of approaching things affect the, the dual paths of Kilua and Gon. But perhaps there's also a lot they can learn from each other in that regard. Yeah, I was wondering about this. I was wondering if 
I was wondering how authoritative Kalua would end up being towards Gon. Oh, there we go. There we go. This is good. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Gon just bought himself a great mentoring situation right now. One on one with the great, great one himself. Someone just pickpocket him? What is it with the characters in the anime and being so, like, direly offended by any kind of physical. Oh my god! I'm talking about the the darkness of, of being a, a spoiled prodigy. And then he just casually murders people. There's a lot of lessons you can learn from anime. One thing I think is like paramount is just if someone bumps into you, leave them alone. It plays out the same way 100% of the time. Wow. Wow. Dual paths and something to learn indeed. And he's telling himself he could have just killed this dude, even though he probably couldn't have as like a desperate attempt to salvage his bruised ego. <laughs> What did I say about putting his body on the line? Okay, Hinata. Not in more than one way. No regard for his own life. It's amazing he survived this long. Oh damn, Gon just won. Man, Kulu is a danger to himself and others. He needs Gon. Gon maybe needs the darkness that he wants to explore. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he's taking a shine to him. And actually, I think what Gon just did is the antidote or the other side of what I was just saying about like just weird self-definition. Kalua framed that whole thing as a total loss and a threat. Gon had nothing at stake, it's just for fun. And he even like conceptualized a smaller victory as a way to gain some emotional utility. In other words, I, I guess it's something like Gon created a mental framework for himself where victory of some kind, some personal benefit was almost ensured. Kalua had almost no upside because him succeeding, it just helps him maintain the mistaken view he already wants to have and is working so hard to have and massive downside, because losing means losing everything. Kilua's view is fragile, Gon's view is anti-fragile. Knitting. <laughs> It's gonna be knitting. Wow, this is a ground-shatteringly interesting episode for Kilua. His coolness is showing some cracks. I was wondering how much stock to put in the assassin background thing, since it is a fantasy setting and like, you know, a lot of things can slide just in, in the whole atmosphere of the show, but no, it's a thing. His is a dark childhood. There's probably more to the story than he's telling too about his parents. Like, I can imagine a brash and proud kid like him spinning the story a certain way maybe even interpreting it that way for the sake of what he's obviously doing which is working really hard to uphold some kind of image of himself without actually really fully living it i mean i think actually the fact that he's great is one of his biggest weaknesses because if you're lying to yourself if you're telling yourself a story about what you already are like you're already the best it's a lot harder if actually you have nothing like if you're just terrible right you can't keep that illusion up as easily but if you're actually talented if you're really good at things or if you're intelligent whatever it is you like can get by just enough to not have to face the reality that you're still a child, you're, you're not fully developed. One thing I've experienced a lot in this regard is I feel like there's a massive trap in intelligence. Sometimes the most intelligent people are the least intelligent, if you know what I mean, like in a, in a very key sense. Pure processing power, intellect, even factual knowledge often has a way of stifling humility. But actually humility is one of the most important elements of intelligence because growing yourself intellectually is a process of like discovery and rediscovery. And if you already know everything, if you've already proven yourself to yourself as being intelligent, you're stuck at that plateau kind of. Your cup is already full. It's probably not full with the, the absolute truth. He who knows everything can learn nothing. Kalua killed those people not because they bumped into him, but because he was mad. He's just angry. It was like he had to do something to reestablish a little bit of the grip he just lost lost over his world. Which again, back to intelligence, is something you see as a coping mechanism quite often. People who work really hard at being sort of intellectually aggressive. Well, this is probably not always true. I mean, sometimes there, there is an important use case for being intellectually aggressive, depending on the stakes and who's listening, etc. A lot of the time, especially just in one-on-one -on -one discourse, it's not really about the idea itself, but about trying to establish or reestablish power, which suggests feelings of powerlessness. At any rate, this friendship just got got a whole lot more intriguing because wow, they are they are very very different. I mean, just thinking about this now, they're fast friends, they're easy friends, and there's a potential for something really beautiful here between the two of them. They have enough of a common element. They're in the same world. They speak the same language, let's say. And so what Whatever is different about the other at that point becomes a compliment. There's also a danger in the ways that their values do not align, that that common language is different. And it has yet to be tested, but I can imagine it being tested 
what happens when Gon is actually a threat to Kahlua. Like I said, Kahlua has a little bit of a, an author authoritative streak. And I mean, actually their, their friendship feels very, very real to me from observing kids and my, my memory as a kid. These two personality types, one very authoritative, one very open and kind of innocent. The latter will often end up following the former. I mean, Gon is a little bit insulated because he's so good. We saw there he's not afraid to like kindly stick up for himself, but I can imagine if Gon starts to outshine Kilua in certain key ways, doesn't fall in line in, in the very specific ways that Kilua needs to identify or challenges Kilua in a way that Kilua has no sufficient answer and therefore feels threatened, I can actually imagine that creating conflict between the two of them. Perhaps central in part to Kahlua's self-identity, on which he relies so, so heavily, is the feeling of superiority. I'm the best, everything is too easy, I can beat anyone. Wait until Gon challenges that, that notion on, on any front.